Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Uh, so glad that you're tuning in this morning uh, as we continue our dive into 2 Thessalonians. We've already finished the first book of Thessalonians and uh, we saw a little bit about how Paul was encouraging the believers and, and uh, answering some questions re regarding Christ's return. And now in 2 Thessalonians, we're diving a little bit deeper as Paul reminds them of some important things. And so as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, I want to start off by getting us a question uh, to think about. And the question is this, how do you get someone to believe a lie? How do you get someone to believe a lie? As you think about it, something probably popped into your mind. Um, hopefully you're not actively trying to get someone else to believe a lie. Um, but when you think about it, um, typically someone to believe a lie, one way is, is to do it slowly or little by little. If you can chip away at the truth, if you can just add a little bit more, you can over time convince someone to believe a lie. Perhaps you repeat it over and over. That's a, an aspect of that slowly, uh, that slow process. Another way is to uh, distract people. So distraction, uh, hiding the, the lie um, with other things. That may even be true, but just kind of like sprinkling it in, so to speak, and distracting with other things. Um, I, I was talking with someone and they mentioned uh, it, it may depend on who uh, tells you the, the various things. Uh, you might believe it because of the person being trustworthy. Uh, they may have believed the lie, uh, but you believe them because they're trustworthy. There's a lot of different things, and I probably didn't uh, reference everything you thought of, but as we look at it and as we think about it, uh, this passage, Paul is going to specifically address a lie that was being told to the believers in Thessalonica. And so um, uh, the point of 2 Thessalonians, the entire book, it was essentially to serve as a reminder to the believers. Paul had already told them many of these things. And so uh, the problem was false teachers, which we're about to read, they, they came in. These false teachers came in claiming to speak on God's behalf. In fact, they even acted as if they were uh, perhaps teaching, uh, bringing a letter from Paul and, and really trying to get them to believe a lie. And so Paul, 2 Thessalonians, the book of 2 Thessalonians is Paul trying to make sure they stood firm on the truth, reminding them of what he had already said. Um, so we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2 verses 1 through 5. We're going to read that in just a minute, but why is the ability for uh, Christians to recognize um, false teaching. Why is the ability to recognize false teaching such an important thing for Christians? Why is that important? I guess I could have asked to begin with, is it important? But I think all of us would agree it's definitely important. So, but why is it? Something probably popped into your mind, but the bottom line is uh, the Bible tells us that there are false teachers. Um, there is a danger of false teachers, and we need to be prepared and ready to stand against these false teachings. So, for example, in 1 John 4, we see that uh, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's other passages, 2 Corinthians talks a little bit about it, but for such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So Paul, uh, he encountered this. There, this was a challenge, this was a problem. And so um, what Paul's about to talk about, um, standing firm, uh, knowing what is true, uh, not just believing, not being disturbed by what anybody says, uh, but testing it, uh, that's very important for believers. And so that's what we're going to dive into and look at. So verses 1 through 5 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this? 
we're going to stop right there. We'll look at the rest of the, the verses in just a minute. Uh, but what Paul is uh, laying down, again, is, is essentially this reminder. He's calling them to remember what was going on. And so he talked about the fact that uh, concerning uh, the day of the Lord, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him. He had already talked about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We read about that already and talked a little bit about it. So he's, he's going back to the subject because it's, it was important. Because in verse 2, there, was these, there were these people who were causing them to be upset. And so that's what we're going to look at real quick. It says here, um, ease, do, do not be easily upset or troubled. Paul is saying, uh, don't be shaken. The word upset means to shake, essentially. Uh, so to, to cause shaky, shakiness. You're not, you're not strong. You're not stable. Uh, Paul's saying, don't be shaken. Don't waver. Don't fall away. Uh, that's the word there for troubled. It's kind of essentially to, to be disturbed or distressed. And so shaken or waver, disturbed, distressed. Paul's saying, don't let what other people are saying cause you to stumble. Don't let other people's messages uh, cause you to be concerned. And so what was going on? What were they doing to make this happen? Uh, well, they were coming and essentially saying here, um, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. So we see three things here. Uh, first of all, we see this idea of by prophecy. Uh, your translation may have the word uh, for spirit, uh, the word there for spirit. Uh, but in the context and in the New Testament uh, literature, essentially what Paul is referring to in, in a very quick and simple way is this idea of a kind of like speaking on behalf of the spirit. Um, and, 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 and it's this spiritual message like a prophet. And we are familiar, the Old Testament definitely, New Testament as well, we, we understand that there were prophets who were speaking on behalf of God. And so um, Paul is referring to people who were coming as if they were speaking on behalf of God, but they were leading the people astray. And so Paul is saying here, um, uh, don't be troubled or upset by a prophecy, someone speaking in, in a spirit-inspired prophecy. He goes on and he says a message. So, or by a message. So the word there, the Greek word there, is simply just the Greek word for word. Um, it's just a, a message. Um, but it, it also has additional meanings, and when you look at the context of Scripture, it also refers to instruction. So essentially, it's, it's a word of instruction. It's uh, teaching or arguments. And so Paul was warning against false doctrine. Uh, people who are bringing a prophecy as if they're speaking on behalf of God, or they're bringing false doctrine, this, this, these, these, this teaching um, that is causing them to be concerned and waver, to shake, and to be troubled. Um, and then finally, one of the ways that they were doing this, and they were, they were uh, able to have uh, essentially some uh, a credibility in the midst of the group there, is because they were, it seems like, they were bringing a letter. Uh, it's possible that they were bringing a letter to deceive them. So he says there are a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. And so they wanted to uh, teach falsely about the day of the Lord. And so they brought a letter saying, hey, Paul, he wrote this. Uh, and so he, he's, he's the one who's teaching this. And so uh, listen to us. Listen to what we're saying. One of the reasons we see that that is likely uh, what, what the issue was, this letter talking about it, is because when we look in uh, chapter 3, verse 17, we see Paul say, I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand, which is an authenticating mark in every letter. This is how I write. Uh, he wanted them to make sure uh, to, to not be deceived by false letters. Um, uh, so these, uh, these counterfeit letters, uh, people claiming to be sending it on behalf of him. Um, and so uh, we see these tactics, this, what was going on, what was trying to cause uh, division and problems and confusion and, and just being upset. Um, so that's what was going on then. But now I kind of want to ask a question. What are some tactics that false teachers might use today to stir up or upset believers? What are some, some things that uh, false teachers might use today? Hopefully it doesn't happen, but uh, we are warned throughout Scripture that there are many false teachers, and so uh, we need to be aware of it. And so some of those possible answers are um, maybe social media 
or news, uh, just causing up uh, dissension or uh, confusion and just concern uh, at whatever's going on. Uh, perhaps um, they are coding the lie with a little bit of truth. Um, maybe they're, they're, they're just giving you a little bit of truth in order to hide the lie that's coming in, in this situation. Um, uh, perhaps they're doing it little by little. I mentioned that at the beginning. How do you get someone to believe a lie? And it's, it's really just eroding at the truth little bit by little bit. And if you can take an inch, um, if, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You may have heard that, that uh, phrase before. Uh, but in reality, if we, if we surrender the truth of God's Word, then eventually we will, uh, we will believe any lie that the, devil, uh, that the devil brings before us. And so we need to stand firm on God's Word. We need to stand firm on God's truth. And so um, this, the situation in, in the first century believers for the church at Thessalonica, they were facing these false teachers. And we can learn from what was going on. So looking at verses 3 through 5, we've already read it, uh, but we see that essentially uh, Paul is talking about them deceiving. Uh, so don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Uh, he was calling them to guard against false teaching. Uh, he was saying, hey, there are people out there trying to lead you astray. You need to be on guard. You need to be prepared. You need to be paying attention. Um, and so uh, what he goes and he talks about a little bit here is essentially uh, he's answering the specific question that they were coming and deceiving the church in Thessalonica about. It was concerning, like it says in verse 1, our Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered to him. They were basically saying that the, the Lord had already come. We saw that in verse 2. And so uh, he goes and he answers and he says, For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Verse 4, he says, He opposes and exalts himself above every so called God or object of worship, though, he, though so that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. So as we look at this, we see these three things, these signs that he's pointing to. Now, Paul is not giving an exhaustive list of what's going to happen. He's, he's trying to uh, remind them of some things that they had already talked about. And so he's pointing to uh, the reality that the day of the Lord has not come. God has not returned. He talked about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But the three things here are apostasy, the man of lawlessness, and the fact that he uh, exalts himself as if he were God. Um, and so what do we see by those? Real quick, the word apostasy really refers to this idea of a rebellion or an abandonment. Essentially this idea of turning away from an established authority or prior commitment. That's the technical term. Uh, but really what it points to is people falling away from the church. Uh, those who, um, who appeared to be believers, who were in the church, um, but they fell away and turned their back on God. Um, and so what he's saying is that the, there are going to be people who are going to flee from the church, uh, whether it's because it's just no longer, uh, just no longer comfortable, there's persecution, there's pressure, uh, whatever the case, or just because of the, the reality that they're drawing away from God. Um, but that is what Paul is talking about here. Um, and it does raise a question uh, about the idea of losing one's salvation. What is Paul saying? Is he saying that there are going to be people who fall away and, and lose their salvation? And I think what's important to understand is, is that in the Bible, throughout Scripture, we see that this idea of a perseverance, someone who perseveres and stays true to the faith, that is a sign of genuine salvation. Uh, Jesus was talking to Peter in John 6 and said, um, would you leave me? Are you too going to leave me? And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Those who are in Christ are going to persevere uh, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, through the protection of the, of the Lord, um, but because of the transformation transformation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so um, it, it's, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. And there's going to be some stumbling, uh, but it's the, the Holy Spirit convicting and, and empowering believers to stand firm. A picture of this comes in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, we see the parable of the wheat 
and the weeds, uh, or perhaps um, the wheat and the tares, essentially the, these weeds. And in this parable, as you read it, verses 24 through 30, you we're going to see um, that this idea of the, the, in the same field, there grew both the wheat and the weeds. And at first they looked the same, but over time uh, it, it was revealed as to their true nature. And so we see that when they grew up, you could tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. And so uh, the thing for us is, is we, we can't see in a person's heart. We don't know that person's heart. And so uh, when people fall away, um, only God knows whether or not their faith, the, the, the placing their faith in the Lord uh, was genuine or not. And so uh, there is this concern, uh, but there's also a consistent uh, preaching of God's word about this, that those who are in Christ uh, are going to persevere and God will provide that strength and that empowerment to do so. So first thing is the apostasy. Second thing is the man of lawlessness, the man of lawlessness revealed. For example, it says there is a figure um, who really opposes God. That's what's basically what's going on here. Uh, when he says the man of lawlessness is revealed, he's not referring to uh, someone who breaks the law of man per se. He's talking about someone who breaks the law of God. It's, it's the fact that there is this individual who opposes God who is actively drawing people away from God. And so this lawlessness is rejecting the law of God. Um, and that's what the focus is. And I think the natural result is, is clear here. What does he say here? Um, the, the, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Uh, we see the destruction of this man uh, because of his um, of, of rebellion against God. Uh, it's, it's assured. It's going to happen. It's not a question. Um, and so um, it is possible. I just want to mention this, that Paul was perhaps mentioning to those who fell away, those who, uh, uh, the apostasy, um, those who um, fell away from the Lord. Uh, it could be referring to the fact that um, they are sons of destruction because of the fact that um, they are uh, dead in their trespasses. And so um, either way, wh whether God, whether Paul's pointing to that or not, um, the idea is very clear. Anyone who is not in Christ is condemned under their sin. And so, um, those are the first two things, the apostasy, the revealing of the lawlessness, the man of lawlessness, and then the fact that he exalts himself. He proclaims himself as God. So what does he say here? He says he opposes, verse 4, opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty clear picture here. Um, the individual who stands against God is also going to stand against all other authorities and claim uh, essentially this undue or exaggerated honor. Now, he doesn't deserve it, but he's going to claim it. Uh, he's going to say, hey, I am I am God. Um, he's not going to stand against the God of the Bible, but he's going to stand against all um, deities, all, all claims of religion, and so to speak. He's going to point out um, his might and his power, um, and he's going to try to draw people to himself to worship him rather than to worship God. And, and so what, what does Paul say here in verse 5? He says, don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this. Paul is wanting them to remember. He's don't, he doesn't want them to be confused. He doesn't want them to be led astray. He doesn't want them to be shaken or troubled. He's wanting them to remember what is the truth. And so uh, we've spent a little bit of time on this, uh, this passage, these couple of verses, uh, but as we dive in to uh, verses 6 through 8 and also finishing up with verses 9 through 12, um, we've got a firm foundation for now looking at a little bit more of this information. So he goes and he says, remember, now he's going to say, let's talk a little bit more about the timing. So looking at verse 6, he says, and you know what currently restrains him. The person being restrained here is the man of lawlessness. He says, And you know what currently restrains him, so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawlessness, excuse me, the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. 
the coming of the lawless one. Oh, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself. We're going to stop there at verse 8. Um, so in these verses, Paul starts off by saying, and you know what? He says, and you know what currently restrains him. Uh, unfortunately for us, Paul wasn't very specific. He didn't lay out all of the information because really it makes sense because what Paul was doing, he was pointing them back to the time he spent with them. Uh, Paul spent about three weeks with them in Thessalonica. And so uh, what Paul is doing here is he's pointing back to First Thessalonians. He's pointing them back to the conversations they had. And he's saying, hey, remember what I told you because what's going to happen is, is he's going to be held back. He's going to be restrained. Um, and so he just wanted to urge them to remember that. And so we don't actually know who this individual is or what this individual is. Notice he says, and you know what currently restrains him. The reason why that's important, the reason why it's not a he, right, uh, or who, it's not a who, it's a what, is because it was neuter. In, in the language, the Greek language, it wasn't a um, uh, masculine or feminine, feminine. it was just uh, generic. And so it could be a thing, a what, the, the physical thing. So we really don't know. Uh, it could be God himself. It could be this idea of the Holy Spirit. It could be the, the gospels holding him back or human governments are holding him back. Uh, whatever the case, um, those are the positive forces. The negative forces is uh, Satan is holding him back. He's, he's biding his time and he's, he's, he's saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release him eventually, but not yet. Um, but the point isn't uh, what Paul is getting at is not the identity of the one or the thing holding him back. The point is that God is in control because he says it's going to happen at his revealed in his time. Uh, so Paul was pointing to the fact that, uh, that God is in control. And so as we look at these verses and we see the fact that the timing is in the future and that God is going to destroy him, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, what are we to, to, to read out of this? What are we to understand this as? What's going to happen? Uh, what do we understand from it? Well, ultimately, Paul was saying this. Even though we don't know what specifically is, is happening, uh, we do know that God is in control. That yes, there will be this time that comes that a man of lawlessness will come. And he will uh, try to do many things, but he's going to be defeated. And so we know that God is in control. We know that God is going to defeat him. So human ability can't restrain him. Only God can be victorious. And, and, and ultimately, God's timing is perfect. Paul is pointing to that. He's pointing to the work of the Lord, that he will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. God is in control. And when he returns, he will be victorious. And, and so um, what's important, though, as we look at this, uh, we do see uh, that there is some things for us to understand. Verse 7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. So the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One thing I did want to note is that when Paul talks about this mystery, he's not referring to something that's unknowing, uh, unknowable. He's just, he's, he used that word for uh, the gospel as well. And uh, I think it was in Colossians chapter one, near the end of the, of the chapter. Uh, Paul is simply saying, um, it's, it's been revealed to us how, how sin, how law Lawlessness is already at work in the world. Uh, we see that people are contrary, are living contrary to God's word. In fact, Paul at other times talked about the fact that um, um, the believers, like in Eph Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, other passages, talks about the fact that, hey, we were all under God's wrath. We were all under our sin and children of wrath. Uh, and so, uh, but we were saved right? We are in Christ, we're saved. Um, and so here, what we see Paul talking about is that there is lawlessness already at work. There's a rebellion against God. Um, so Ephesians chapter 2 says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Um, so we see that, um, you know, there is a time that's going to come, but even right now, uh, people are rebelling against God. And so what, what is the, the thing for us to think about is really to understand that where do we see the spirit of lawlessness at work today? And when we look at God's word, we look at his intention for creation, when we look at his, the fact that he loved us and he sent his son to die for us, where do we see people working against that? 
Now you might be thinking of various things, and I'm just going to mention a couple things. Uh, greed, selfishness, uh, wars, abortion. Uh, there are so many areas, uh, even in our own life. I mentioned selfishness and greed. Uh, we can um, we can give in to uh, the flesh, the temptation of the flesh, and and we can uh, work against God. Uh, but we need to conform to Him, be conformed to Him, um, and become more like Christ. We need to get rid of um, the the selfishness and the flesh in us. Uh, but wherever we see lawlessness at work, wherever we see that, uh, we as the church need to stand firm. We as a church need to serve to restrain evil. And we need, first of all, we need to make sure we're living according to God's word. We're living in a way that is glorifying to him and, 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 and shows the love of Christ to others. Uh, we need to speak the truth in love. And so it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. And the world is going to stand against it. Uh, but we need to stand firm on the truth of God, not believing a lie, not being deceived, but standing firm. And so, um, I already mentioned it, but it says that Jesus will destroy him and bring him to nothing. And so we see this idea of basically make him powerless. And so uh, it's really encouraging as we read this scripture, when we see that Jesus is victorious, it is going to help us live out our faith here and now. And we're going to be able to stand firm. Because when we see it, uh, we, um, we need to understand that he is in control. And since he is in control, we can trust in his words. No matter what we are facing, we know that God is with us. And so he's going to hold everyone accountable for their actions. So the justice and the righteousness that he bring, will bring is going to be amazing. And we need to trust in that. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people who don't realize this, that don't understand this, that are deceived by this man of lawlessness. So look at verses 9 through 12. Verses 9 through 12, we're going to see this. It says, the coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they, do, they did not accept the love of the truth, and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion, delusion, so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned, those who do not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. This deception that's coming their way is, is going to be based on Satan's work. He is working against the gospel. Um, we see in Mark 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Jesus is saying, some are like the word sown on the path, when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown to them. Uh, so we see him working actively against the gospel, uh, desiring that no one would come to know the Lord. First Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, uh, Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time, to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you <clears throat> because of your lack of self-control. Uh, Satan is actively working, and he's desiring to uh, cause um, just um, division and, and trouble and concern and, and basically shake and trouble uh, uh, the church. Uh, and so what Paul is pointing to here is the fact that there is a reality. It's going to happen, um, and we need to be prepared. Um, it's based on Satan's work. So what is going to happen, though? How is he going to make it happen? How are people going to be deceived? Well, he says he's going to do this with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders. Miracles, signs, and wonders. It's interesting that those words, miracles, signs, and wonders, are used in the Gospels uh, to describe the works of Jesus. And so we see that Satan, his goal, his, his plan, is to appear as an agent of good, essentially. Uh, that's another verse in 2 Corinthians where it says, And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Uh, and so uh, these miracles, these signs, these wonders, are going to be amazing. But they're going to be for the purpose of serving himself. And so I guess what's really important is how can believers, how can we determine if a miracle or a sign or a wonder is from God or if it's counterfeit? Um, and really, it boils down to a couple things. First of all, um, the astonishing acts that are going to happen are going to mislead people 
but it's going to mislead people to exalt the wicked one. It's going gonna, it's gonna to turn people away from God and turn people to himself. And so it's very important for cre- us as Christians, as believers in, in the world, we need to be aware, be, beware um, of Christian figures that boast about or draw attention to themselves instead of God. Um, and so anyone who draws attention to themselves instead of God is a concern. We need to make sure we're not doing that uh, because uh, in our selfishness, we can uh, glorify ourselves, but we need to be concerned. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says we need to test the Spirit. Uh, sec- uh, secondly, uh, we need to see that uh, Jesus performed miracles to help others and to lead people to God, whereas this one will be about himself and to, to turn people away from God. Uh, so we see this concern, this deception that is going to come. But then, interestingly, when we look in verse 11 and 12, we see that God is essentially going to hand the people over to their deception. And, and what, what he's saying, it seems a little odd at first. It may ask the question, is God going to lie to people? Is God going to cause people to be deceived? Is he going to, is he going to tell them a lie? Um, so let's read verses 11 and 12 again. It says, For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they will believe the lie so that they will be condemned. And then we, he explains, uh, kind of in parentheses, essentially, what's going on. It's those who do not believe, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. Um, um, it reminds me of a, a, a verse in, in, in Romans chapter 1, another, another book of the Bible that Paul wrote. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, he says this, Therefore God delivered them over, in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served that which has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. And so what we see in Paul's uh, other letters, what we see here right now is that those who delight in unrighteousness, those who want uh, they hated the lightness, um, and they loved the darkness and hated the lightness because their deeds were wicked. What Paul is saying here is that God is going to look at them and he's going to say, you're fine, your will be done. If you don't want to sur- surrender and submit to me, if you don't want to receive my love and my forgiveness, then I'm going to hand you over to the deception. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, essentially allow you to go down that path. And so you will face the judgment for your sins and for your actions, um, but there is a condemnation. And I think what's really important is this, as we look at that, it says those who are condemned, those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. Um, John 3.16, very popular, very familiar verse. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But when you look just a a few verses later at verse 18, it says, Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And so we see this condemnation um, is removed when you believe in Jesus. They remain condemned when they reject Jesus. So because they did not believe the truth of the gospel, they are remaining in their sin. And we see that they are delighting in their unrighteousness because the flesh is wicked. And we need to, um, we need to realize that and understand it. So this passage, these verses, the man of lawlessness is kind of a, a title that's in my scripture, in my, my Bible, uh, but it just gives a, an overarching title. What is going on? How do we apply it in our lives? What we see here is is really this this uh, message of encouragement, a message of remind a reminder uh, to them to stand firm on God's word. And so, I guess the question is this: What effect do you think this message had on the Thessalonian believers? What what effect do you think this message had? As we look at it, as we think about it, I would say that it was uh, probably very encouraging. Um, it was encouraging because we know that God is going to be victorious. This man of lawlessness probably brought some concern and some uh, just heartache, but really we shouldn't be concerned because God is in control. I, I would say it was probably pretty challenging. Uh, it challenged them to stand firm on God's word. It challenged them to know the truth and to, um, to live in a way uh, that is honoring to God. Uh, I would say it was probably convicting as well. Or it informed them. It was enlightening, just saying, hey, this is how God is going to win. And so, but the point is, that's how it probably, possibly affected them. 
But here's the next question. What effect should it have on us? And I would say, what effect should it have on us in, when it relates to evangelism, sharing the gospel? So when we look at it, basically the same can be said about us. We should be encouraged knowing that God is in control, that he is victorious. We should also see Paul's words as a challenge or maybe a a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, It's for us to stand firm. It's a challenge for us to stand firm in the Word of God, not being drawn away from the truth by a lie. I would say also, uh, regarding evangelism, we should be drawn to the lost. We need to see the coming judgment to those who are dead in their trespasses. And, and as we read scripture, we see how God's love, how his concern, how his grace and his forgiveness was extended to us, that he sent his son to, si- to die on the cross for our sins. And so our call is to be obedient to him, to share the gospel. Um, essentially, we need to get the gospel to those who are lost, those who are hurting, and those who are in danger of facing condemnation because of their sin. And we're not here to, uh, to, to judge. We're here to ex- share the, this lifeline of God's word, God's love, and God's grace. Uh, because God is truth. Uh, what he has done, what he has said, and what he brings is truth. And so here's the challenge I want to leave with you. Um, either if you're not a, f- a follower of Christ, if you hear this and you're like, man, I really, I'm just playing a part. I haven't actually trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That is the first thing, the most important thing. And so reach out to a follower of Christ. Um, tr- well, first of all, pray out to God and say, God, I need you to save me. Uh, I can't do it on my own. So, so ask God to save you. Second, get plugged in. And then, but for believers, um, we need to consider how we can establish So start doing it or strengthen uh, our time in God's Word, our daily Bible reading, so that we can know God's Word. Because knowing God's Word helps us avoid being deceived. I uh, hope you enjoyed diving into the Scripture. It was a little bit longer than I wanted to go, but uh, hopefully you learned something from it. But also, hopefully, uh, God can use us in your life. And so I'm going to pray for us, and we'll be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for the challenge and the conviction of your spirit. God, as we stand firm on your word, as we look forward uh, to your return, and uh, we are also asking for your deliverance uh, and your strength and your might, God, please help us live for you, showing the love of Christ to others so that we can live boldly for the gospel. God, please please keep us uh, in your word so we will not be deceived, we will not be drawn away, we will not believe a lie. God, thank you for how you are working in our midst. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.